Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Back with us today is Dr. Jennifer Stetler. We were discussing last week her book, The Busy Caregiver's Guide to Advanced Alzheimer's Disease and her Dementia Connection Model. And today we're going to discuss how the model can be applied to different challenging situations, behaviors that we run across as caregivers. So thanks for joining us again, Jennifer. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So I did a social media poll on basically all of the challenges that we face with showering, toileting, changing clothes. Let's see what else. Eating, all the things. Pretty much there was only, I think toileting was the one that got the least votes, but it was still way up there. So I guess we should jump in because we have like all of them to discuss if we have time today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so when we talk about ADL care, right? And so we can kind of rope in some of those challenges that you just named into ADL care, right? So how difficult it is to bathe them, you know, at times, um, how how difficult sometimes is it for dressing, um, how difficult sometimes is it for feeding, right? You know, the, the entirety is to look at this, you know, first I always talk about why is this happening? Why is it more difficult, you know, during these things that you would think, um, regularly come to an adult, right? And so just to recap from our first session, you know, when we talk about the dementia connection model, the first component is really the why, which is that theory of retrogenesis that I bring into the framework of the model, right? And that theory was developed by Dr. Barry Reisberg. And just briefly, you know, essentially his work has shown that individuals with dementia as they're progressing through the disease, and my book focuses mostly on moderate to late stage dementia, right, is that uh, those individuals are mimicking a developmental age of anywhere from seven years old to four weeks old. And so it's really important that we accept that that's what's going on with the people we're caring for, because a lot of times we have these high expectations, right, of an, an older adult should be acting like an older adult. They can take care of all of these things. And when we have these high expectations, then we set ourselves up for frustration and for failure because they're not meeting those expectations because they, it's not that they don't want to, they certainly would want to, they just can't anymore. Their brain and brain functions have deteriorated to the point where it looks very similar to a young child's brain. So just like a young child, when they're born as an infant, right, their brain grows and it gets bigger and it gets healthier and it has more neural connections and all those things, right, because they're navigating life. And so in the same reverse, unfortunately, with people with dementia, it uh, gets smaller, it deteriorates, right, and it goes back to its rudimentary function, right? So with that said, it's really important for us to accept that, to say, there's reasons why they can't do these things anymore. And I'm sure that they would want to, but they can't. And as a caregiver, I'm willing to accept that, right? This is kind of their new normal, right? Now, as we talked about in the first episode, what's, what's, let's look at maybe the positive out of this is you get to know who they were as they get younger. You get to know who they were when they were 20, when they were 15, when they were seven, right? You get to know all of that, which is wonderful because you get to know that person as a younger version. And let's say you're a, a caregiver, like a family, a daughter, or maybe you're a son. Um, you didn't know them at that age, obviously. And so the cool part is that you get to know them. And it's, uh, although there, of course, there's this process that you're losing that person you knew, part of it is reframing it to say, how can I get to know the new person that I'm spending this time with and celebrate who they were at that time, when they were 20, when they were 15, when they were seven, right? It's just a way to kind of reframe it in your mind. So it, it's uh, when you're dealing with the grieving process, it settles it a bit more, right? And so one, it's lowering the expectation of what we expect from the person we're caring for, knowing that they aren't capable of those things that they used to uh, be able to do. But two, it allows us to nurture some of that grieving process a little bit better through that theory of retrogenesis. And so diving into ADLs, I know last uh, episode, we did talk a little bit about uh, bathing, right? And so 
the key here in the dementia connection model is repetition, right? So I talk about the three R's, which is routine, which is that's that repetition. Remind, which is sensory cues we're going to talk about here in a second. And the third R is the reward. So if you are consistently using sensory cues, the person you're treating uh, has, you know, experiences the reward because they're calm, cool, collected, and you yourself are feeling confident and successful because the person is responding to what you're asking them to do, right? And so through that second component, it's called habilitation, right? You're going to use those three R's. That's the how do you implement the model, right? And then the third aspect is the actual intervention, which is sensory stimulation. And so you are going to be uh, taking uh, in or using different tools that will uh, stimulate their senses in various ways through the five senses that will promote or influence positive feelings. Okay. Now you're probably thinking, well, how do things that stimulate your senses promote positive feelings? How does that happen? So just really briefly, um, when we ignite our senses, we are actually either directly or indirectly influencing our limbic system. Okay. And that's housed in our brain. And a very important organ in the limbic system is called the amygdala, which one of its major function is generating emotions, right? So depending on which things you're stimulating, you are basically influencing that amygdala to generate positive emotions if it's a positive experience, right? What I mean by that is, let's say you're going to use auditory stimulation, and you're going to play music, right? You want to play the music that your loved one likes, not the music they don't like, right? If you play the music they like, you're going to influence positive emotions. If it's what they don't like or it has negative memories associated with it, then unfortunately they are going to act out negatively, right? So it could be, it could work in your favor or it may not work in your favor. That's why knowing their preferences are very important. Now, one key I want to note, we didn't talk about this in the first session, is their preferences may change. Their preferences might be what they used to like to do or used to like to experience when they were younger. So what do I mean by that? Let's talk about food really quick, right? So there's been studies around this to say, sure, maybe mom, dad had, you know, certain food types that liked as adults, but as they get younger, I always say that as they get a little younger, right, towards their more developmental age, they actually might start liking sweets because children like sweets, right? So maybe they weren't really a sweet person as an adult, but they more than likely are going to move towards food that they like when they were children. And if it was sweets, then they're going to want sweets, right? That's the gustatory stimulation. So that's just an example. So that's really how the framework works between the three pillars, right? Which is retrogenesis, habilitation, and sensory stimulation. It's the why, the how, and the what, right? And what you're going to do when you're intervening. And so with bathing, we talked about last time, really, uh, we talked about setting up a structured way to stimulate their senses. So we talked about um, know when you're going to provide the shower or bath. And when you uh, have that experience, every time you're going to use a few things that will uh, generate uh, positive emotions by using different kinds of sensory stimulation tools. So we talked about using aromatherapy. We talked about allowing the person to hold like a loofah or a sponge. That's your tactile stimulation. And of course, aromatherapy is olfactory stimulation. We talked about maybe playing their favorite music. That's auditory stimulation. So just with those three approaches, if there was a positive response, which is that immediate response, and they are in a good mood and they're going along with things, then you know that that's success. So what you're going to do is every time you bathe or shower them, you're going to set this up the same way, same aromatherapy, same loofah sponge holding it, same music. Because over a period of time, about four to six weeks, they have the ability to learn through what's called a learned positive response that they associate this experience with you, which really enhances that connection, right? They're going to uh, want to be bathed more. They're going to uh, listen to you more during that, right? So on and so forth. And that's why it's called the dementia connection models to find a way to positively influence their mood. So they associate that with you. And that's that whole concept of, they may not remember your name. They may not remember who you are, but they remember how they feel with you, right? That's that mm -hmm. whole concept there. So, so I, have a, I have a quick question on the music. Would you, for showering, maybe play more calm, like peaceful, like, you know, spa type music, not necessarily 
that specific style, but maybe not like their favorite, you know, pop rock and roll songs or whatever. It's like, I know we're we're talking about people in their 70s now. So we're talking Mm -hmm. about music from like the 60s and the early 70s is really popular. So Mm -hmm. which it's hard. It's hard for me to wrap my head around that sometimes, because when I think of older adults, I don't think of 60s and 70s because I was around then. So would you play like (laughs) quieter music or just kind of try different styles that they like that you are fairly confident they like to see which works better? I would try different styles that they like, because although we associate going to the spa and having this tranquil music, that, that may not be their jam, right? So you can try it and see if that is very relaxing for them, or you can try more upbeat music if that keeps them more alert and focused. So it's really going to be a trial and error. In, the, in um, my book that uh, is coming out here October 19th, What's great, it's a workbook style. So you can actually take notes of the, I go through all various ADLs and behavioral expressions that are pretty common in the disease process. And uh, I go through each sense and how you can implement tools associated with each sense. And then you're going to take notes on what's working and what's not working. So by the time you're done with the book, you have this full kind of figuratively speaking, toolbox of tools you can use with your loved one and try to implement those consistently. So I asked about the music because I recently saw a video online of a a woman with dementia. She Mm -hmm. was just rocking out to some (laughs) ACDC. And I'm just thinking, you know, you might not want to choose highway to hell in the shower, (laughs) but maybe you would. I I actually kind of like upbeat music. That's because, you know, the morning you kind of want to get the blood flowing. So mm-hmm. that's definitely something to consider because Absolutely. like at one point they switched my mom's shower to the afternoon. My mom was positively not an afternoon showering person. If she had, you know, like she was going to work on painting a bedroom or something, and she got to three thirty, four o'clock in the afternoon. She might do a spongy kind of bath, just kind of clean up a little bit and then just take care of it the next morning. Cause at a certain point in the day, it's like almost pointless. And when they switched her back to the date, the morning, they had less, uh, less resistance, but they didn't try any of these methods that, that you talk about, which I think would su- be super helpful. I think they always felt rushed. I think we need a different model in our, our care homes so that we can make these connections and make life better for everybody, the caregivers, the person we're caring for and the families and And I talk about, too, in the book, um, to to your point about the perfect day. And my business partner and I, um, Jessica Ryan, uh, with my company, Neuro Essence, we we talk about the perfect day often. And it's really a a setup of what do you do in the morning, what do you do in the afternoon, and what do you do early evening right before sundowning that incorporates some of these sensory tools and how you want to set up the day So that way, the person with dementia is really set up for success just in how their uh, circadian rhythm is going to be affected as the disease progresses. So essentially, just some key things, and this will help to, um, one, create an experience where they're going to want to pay attention and focus more with you and the things you're asking them to do, but two, to mitigate some of those behavioral expressions that um, I talk about in the book, right? So there's sundowning, of course, potential depression, hallucinations, you know, those kinds of things. So, um, so essentially in the morning, right, I'm going to play off of three things. I'm going to play off of um, uh, olfactory stimulation, uh, auditory stimulation, and then I'm going to talk about cognitive stimulation. Okay. So what we call our sixth sense, right? (laughs) So with uh, olfactory in the morning, you'll want to diffuse like a peppermint and a citrus together, right? Both of those properties are known for helping with increase in focus and attention. And then uh, that's the peppermint. And then the uh, citrus scent actually helps to improve mood. Um, And so research has uh, a backing with regards to how it works uh, with your different neurotransmitters in your brain. And so that would be what you'd want to diffuse in the morning to get them started for the day. Now, the citrus is going to be good, too, in the morning because citrus also, we talked about this in the first episode, actually helps increase appetite. So we want to get them nice and full for the morning, right? 
So you want them to focus and pay attention in the morning, of course, because of ADL care and then potential activities that you might have them engaged in and get their start, you know, their uh, day started right. And then, like I said, the citrus is going to help to improve their mood and increase their appetite. From a music standpoint, um, there was research done out of Harvard University, actually, by a fellow named Josh Friedis. Uh, he wrote the book called The Dementia Concept. And so he talks a lot about music in the morning would be upbeat music with words. And the reason, and upbeat music of their preference, of course, reason with words is because oftentimes when we hear music we like, we sing to it, right? So why this is great is, well, of course, it'll help increase mood, but also it will help to get their verbal skills started for the day. We know that communication is a challenge and it will continue to be a challenge. This helps them practicing their words through uh, very common uh, sounds that they know because it's a, it's a song they recognize and that they have liked for so long. So that's the kind of music in the morning. And then in the activity that you want to do for cognitive stimulation will be anything that is more on the intent side. So if it's uh, physical activity, if it's um, crossword puzzles, if it's word searches, if it's trivia, all that should be in the morning when they're the most fresh. Okay. Now let's transition to more of the afternoon, like around lunchtime. So the aroma that you want to diffuse then would just be a, a citrus blend because you want to continue to increase their appetite. You want to continue them to have uh, improved mood. Okay. The music that you'd want to play around lunch is upbeat music, no words. And because you want them to socialize. Their verbal skills have started in the morning. You want them to now use their own words to socialize. So um, if you have words, they might unfortunately just mimic the song and not actually socialize with peers and things like that or family. And then the, um, the uh, activity that you'd want to do at that time is we start to slow down a bit, right? So there might be some light stretching after lunch. There might be some relaxation after lunch. That might be the time that they go down for what I call a rest period. I know formally people know it as naps. I like to call them rest periods to be more respectful, but they might go down for the rest period to rest their brain. And if you think about uh, just side note, you know, because we're talking about how children function, right, because they're going back to an earlier time in their life, right, before the age of seven, most children before the age of five are on nap or nap schedules, right? And so just as important as for them to rest their brain, people with Alzheimer's disease, moderate to late stage, it's important that they rest their brain too. So I know oftentimes families are concerned, why my mom sleep all the time or whatever it might be. It's important to look at why she might be sleeping because there could be other underlining issues, but there is a natural progression where they'll take more uh, rest periods during the day than at night. So with that said, it's, it's okay that they do that after lunch, right? Um, and so with that said, that activity might be more relaxation, maybe some um, light music after uh, lunch, that kind of thing, right? Then we get into right before sundowning. And I always say, you know, you'll get to understand that time. Is it three? Is it four? Is it five? About 30 minutes before, okay, we're going to go through the three things again. With the aroma, you want to diffuse a lavender. That's a very relaxing scent. And it's something that is, of course, it's been a scent used for centuries, but um, it really has just an overall calming experience to the uh, to the body, right? Um, it also has been shown to help improve mood in, in certain situations. So that's good. Music, okay? We want to start to move into that more relaxing music, right? So think about music that's more classical, but with one tone. So we call that non biharmonic which is like a flute playing or a guitar or a piano, okay? It doesn't have all of these, not a full orchestra because that'll be too overstimulating, right? Um, and then the, um, the more activity that you want to do is certainly something relaxing, right? So it could be a light massage. It could be reading. It could be um, you know, uh, if they're, if the area or at home, you have like a fish tank that they could look at or bird watching or something like that, right? Very relaxing because you want them to move into the sundowning hour, very relaxed and calm. And through, uh, the, my experience with, uh, when working with patients, when I've done that is we've been able to minimize, if not completely mitigate, uh, behavioral expressions during sundowning. So you get the, um, immediate effect, right? 
you get to see your routine. What worked in those three? Did all three work for you in terms of morning, afternoon, evening? And then you do this consistently on a daily basis. So you set yourself up with a routine. You're setting them up with a routine. And really in about four to six weeks, they will learn all of these things if you're consistent and they will have this what we call learned positive response. And so uh, with that said, through that, you know, this, uh, the three R's, right? Routine, remind, reward, you will have uh, really a way to rely on how our mom or dad are going to react. And they have a way to rely on you to know how you're going to react. And that's the win-win. It makes sense. Now, in regards to sundowning, I always thought it was that time of day between daylight and dark where there's not a lot of contrast in the light. And so it's very confusing. Is it also because they're, you know, get, get to the late afternoon, you're starting to get a little tired, especially when your brain is working so hard to just function. Do we know what triggers the sundowning behaviors? Is it both of those or neither? It's both of those actually. So it is um, because there's a confusion of day. So they don't know, their body's getting tired, but they don't know if it's yet nighttime, if their body should be tired. So it's kind of like their brain and their body are not um, talking to each other. And one's really tired and the other one is saying, no, wait, I'm supposed to still stay up, right? So there's that conflict. um, And that's all have to do with circadian rhythm. But the other is, of course, this, uh, how can you cope with being tired, right? As adults, you and I, if we get tired, we have, we know how to cope. We either will maybe drink caffeine, you know, Um, I would, um, of course, have some peppermint going for myself because that helps to kind of wake you up. Um, Some people might uh, go outside for a fresh, you know, fresh air and kind of wake themselves up a little bit if they know that nighttime is, is, is still a bit of ways away. Right. So as adults, we, we have a way to work through that, but unfortunately with people with dementia, they're losing the ability to problem solve and to anticipate what comes next. And that is all housed here in the frontal lobe, which unfortunately is one of the first areas amongst another area that is, is starting to deteriorate over time. And so they don't know how to problem solve. So if I'm getting tired, I don't know what to do to fix that. How do I feel comfortable? So they rely on their caregiver to do that for them, right? The other thing too, is they don't know how to anticipate what comes next. So if they say, okay, well, night's coming, but I'm tired, what's supposed to come next? We all know that we're going to lay down and go to bed at some point. They don't know that, right? They don't remember that anymore. So there's that anxiety that starts to creep in. So that's, it's a combination of those things that are occurring is lack of coping skills, lack of problem solving, lack of not being able to anticipate risks. They're tired. What do they do? Now, the way I kind of picture it, because we talked about this new world that they're experiencing, right, which is anywhere from seven years old to four weeks old, right, developmentally. So think about this. Think of a two-year-old who's had no nap all day. It's now five o'clock. What are we getting, right? Temper tantrums and screaming and yelling and sometimes hitting it's very much mimics what a person with dementia might experience during a sundowning, right? Now, the key here is the interventions we're talking about all have to be done respectfully and with dignity, right? So by no means do we talk about, even though we're talking about a way to conceptualize what's going on with the person with dementia, we're not saying treat them like children. That's by no means is that what the model is entailed to do or what I talk about in the book. And actually, I very much mentioned, this is not about treating your loved one like a child. It's about understanding where they're coming from and then meeting them there, right? Which is basically they're at a developmental age that's different. But there are things that we can implement, like I'm talking about with music and with aromas that are all adult-like, but they do work very well with children as well. So, um, so yeah, so to your point, it's, it could be, it's several things that are occurring and why sundowning happens and not every person with Alzheimer's disease sundowns, but it is very common. And it's something that you, it's not necessarily something that you want to say, okay, I want to fix it and we'll go away forever. It's not that is the case. It's more, how can you minimize it as much as possible? And through this, uh, through my model, the dementia connection model, if you're doing it routinely, you will be able to hopefully minimize it. It makes sense about the the disconnect between their brain and their body. Cause my mom would sometimes ask me what time it is. And I would tell her and she would say either, Oh, is it that late? Or, Oh, it's, it's that early. It was usually, she always thought it was later. 
in the day. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, you know, that I just, you talk about the two year olds not having a nap. I remember if my daughter didn't have a nap when she was two, <laughs> it was ugly. By the time her, I worked, yeah. I had different days off than her dad. And so the two days that we were home together, her and I, and he was at work, he would come home from work and she'd just be like, awful. Mm -hmm. Be like, here, you can have her now. I'm out here. I'm out. It's <laughs> just like, mm -hmm. by the time you're making dinner, they're having a complete meltdown because they haven't taken a nap. And it's, so it's a really good right. analogy because we understand that one. And that's, that's helpful a lot. So. And I talk about too in the book that um, the way to know if, if uh, the person you're caring for is on track with how much they should be sleeping during the day is kind of used as a rule of thumb. When they're in their early stages, they may or may not have naps uh, or, or what I call rest periods. Um, if they're in their moderate stage, then they probably would have about one to two a day, morning and afternoon, right? And if they're in the later stages, they might have two plus. OK, so that's normal. So let's just say mom or dad is in the earlier stages and they're sleeping all the time. Like there's something else going on that you'd want to check with their primary physician with. Or make sure they're getting enough exercise and stimulation as well. Exactly. Because right. mm -hmm. now I know as they get further into the disease, it disrupts their sleep pattern. Because one of the things with my mom, she was a good sleeper. Until about the last, everything happened in the last year, which is not surprising. But the one of the caregivers would say, oh, yeah, your mom gets up about 2.30, 3 o'clock. And I was like, really? Her? <laughs> it was just surprising. And she's like, yeah, she'll just sit with me and talk for a little while. And then I escort her back to bed. So I know that's really hard for family caregivers when their loved one lives with them. Because if you're awake in the middle of the night, or if they're awake in the middle of the night, you're awake. And now your sleep is affected. So if they're not sleeping through the night, should we try to limit the rest periods like later in the afternoon or is that just a... Well, you point? know, unfortunately, it, it, what probably was going on with mom is that it was mimicking more of an infantile sleep pattern. And so um, it is going to get to the point where they're going to be up more during at night than it is during the day, because that's how infants sleep patterns are. It's more sporadic, right? And, you know, they don't, they aren't sure when's night, and when's day. So yes, if they're sleeping a lot during the day and it's not in, indicative of their, um, you know, the stage that they're in, then I would say, you know, talk with the physician about other underlying conditions to fix those so they aren't sleeping so much during the day and hopefully helping their sleep at night. But if they are into the late to final stages of the disease, they're likely going to be up more at night than during the day. And it's one of those where caregivers then have to decide, you know, is this something I can continue to care for? Uh, with my loved one at home 24 seven, or do I need assistance with this, right? If it's getting too much, um, because it is something where, yes, those, those that final year, or those final few months can be very difficult. And, but again, let's expectation wise, when we have an, and when we just have a newborn baby, there's those first few months, that first year is difficult and the caregiver is sleep deprived as well, right? So it's a very similar fashion of what's happening you know, during those kind of late to final stages. See, now I've never had anybody explain it like that. And I know there was many caregivers that just, they literally lose their minds from lack of sleep and trying to solve that problem. And it doesn't sound like it's 100% solvable. Right, right. They're saying I do have a sleep chapter in my book that talks about ways to enhance sleep with different types of stimulation. So one of those is you can use uh, aromatherapy through the evening. Um, what we'd recommend is that you diffuse all night, not, not just intermittent or not just for a certain number of hours. And the great thing with the aromatherapy machines is once the water runs out, they turn off. So it's not really a fire hazard. So but diffuse through the whole night using lavenders would be the first one to first oil to try because of its relaxing properties. Um, it actually um, has shown that it's improved sleep in research. And the bonus is that it's actually shown to promote balance 
physical balance. We know that falls are a biggie, especially when they get up in the morning. So this actually has helped decrease falls in the morning. So with that said, I would try something like that. Um, and there's some other techniques in my book that you can look at. But yes, I would say it's, it's good to try, but we also have to come to the realization of what's really happening with mom or dad and say, okay, this might just be the, the ultimate progression or the end of that progression. Um, and then understand it that way. No, that's really helpful. Cause I don't think I was, I knew that progression affected their sleep but i didn't realize that that's something we should just expect that they will be up a lot more like a newborn which is horrifying although my daughter slept five hours at a stretch from birth to a month and then slept through the night at a month so you guys can all hate on me because which was good because at a month when my daughter was literally a month old to the day my mom she hit a drunk driver that turned in front of her and she she hit her face so hard on the steering wheel that it damaged the nerve that comes right through your cheekbone. So her face on one side was always numb and it shattered all of the blood vessels and um, capillaries in her eye. So that was, she had a very red Christmassy eye, was very gross. <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't think they ever even did an MRI or I don't think they did anything on her brain. And that was about two and a half two let's see my daughter was two and a half so like yeah about two and a half years before i think she started showing signs of alzheimer's so i i think that that did not help her brain at all it couldn't have it couldn't have done it any favors but i don't i don't because she broke her ankle as well and they they focused more on that because she was like 49 so it wasn't like she i don't think you know this was back in 1991 so it was like the old days <laughs> So let's see, to we didn't, the one topic that I guess, I don't know, people wanted to hear about as much, but I think it's important is toileting because I know that's a challenge for lots of people. And one of the topics that people don't always want to talk about is toileting. It got the least amount of upvotes on the social media quiz about our conversation, but I, I know it's something people struggle with. So before we talk about food let's just we're just gonna go in the wrong order here so how how can we make toileting less of a nightmare <laughs> for lack of a better term absolutely so a couple of things um and this is again when i when i'm recommending obviously it all ties into some form of sensory stimulation so when we talk about um you know, we have to figure out, you know, what's going on, why aren't they necessarily going into the toilet, right? So a couple of things from an environmental perspective, this is where the uh, visual stimulation comes in is it's very hard for um, individuals with dementias, their eyes are changing and they are getting younger with their eyes, right? White is very blurry to them as it is very similarly to an infant. Infants can't see white very well. And so, but unfortunately, most of our toilets are pearly white, right? So, um, so the uh, manufacturers do make uh, the toilet lids, the seat itself, um, in contrasting colors. So, I would recommend some kind of bold color, like a red or a, a green um, or a blue. I mean, obviously, you want to try and match your aesthetics as best as you can, but. Um, that's going to really help drive the attention towards the toilet so they know that's where they need to go. Otherwise, you're going to have things like unfortunate accidents around the toilet, or when they sit down, they might miss the toilet because they can't really see it, you know, those kinds of things. Or when they look into the bathroom, they don't really see a toilet. It's just all blurry. So therefore, we're, that's not where I need to go to go to the bathroom. And as they're searching, they might unfortunately have an accident or go someplace they shouldn't, right? So that's one thing we can do aesthetically. The other thing too is um, uh, with aromatherapy, you can diffuse peppermint on going into the bathroom itself. They'll associate the scent, but also the biggest thing is that it does help with focus and attention. So that way they're kind of staying in the moment while they're going and, 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 and whatnot. Now, this is the thing I know a lot of people say, like my mom will say that she has to go to the bathroom, but she just went, I just took her. And then she just, she has to go again. And so um, as silly as this sounds, I always say, we'll associate some kind of uh, 
sensory uh, stimulating experience in the moment while she's going to the bathroom. So for example, uh, while she's going to the bathroom, you might say to her, mom, can you hold the toilet paper? And so, you know, the feeling of tactile stimulation in her hand, she's feeling the toilet paper. And she knows that toilet paper is associated with going to the bathroom because th- she's been using toilet paper for 60, 65, 70 years, right? So it's not only, of course, the auditory stimulation of hearing toilet paper associated with bathing or going to the bathroom, excuse me, um, or tactile stimulation, which we talked about in the first episode. What's important about that is, Um, A process called neuroplasticity is occurring in the brain, and a side benefit to neuroplasticity is that it increases focus and attention. So the more they're paying attention to the experience, they're going to remember that it's going on, right? So that's different ways that you can kind of associate that she just went to the bathroom or when the toilet is flushing, you could say, oh, mom, isn't that a silly sound of the, the toilet flushing? So we're using the word toilet, flushing, all words associated that she's been using with the uh, going to the bathroom for years, right? So try that and see if that helps for her remembering that she just went to the bathroom. But other things that you can do to toileting schedules, and what I mean by that is um, trying to encourage that person to go to the bathroom anywhere from every one to two hours can help decrease accidents, right? Because they're, again, not thinking that they need to go, they're not remembering. And unfortunately, over time, there's going there's a signal in our brain that initiates the ability to tell us that we have to go that will um, eliminate over time. And then they will unfortunately become incontinent. And that is the same process in reverse that infants go through. It, infants, when they're born, don't have the signal. And in about a year, two, two years, they start to have the signal. And that's when you start to see them run behind the furniture and they act like they got to go. <laughs> they go in their diaper, right? Um, that is that signals forming. So of course we talk about everything in reverse, it's going away for people with dementia. So with respect to that, um, doing the toilet in schedule every one to two hours and encouraging them to go can help prevent some accidents. Um, and then again, trying to have them remember that they just went is using the, some of the strategies I just talked about before. I wonder if the contrasting toilet seat would have helped my mom because one day as we were leaving, she announced she had to use the bathroom. And when she got in, fortunately, when they remodeled the the community, the tile was not white in the bathroom. And it was actually quite, an, it was, it had enough contrast that the toilet probably did stand out. I have to think about that one a little more. But she sat down on the toilet so if the toilet is facing north south she basically sat on it east west which of course if you've ever tried that very uncomfortable so she (laughs) sat down and it you know was not at all what she was expecting and then she stood up with her pants around her ankles it was just like yikes and i'm thinking you know so then i'm trying to get her to to move around to the front but not trip over it was not fun and of course she got irritated because as she sat down it was uncomfortable so that was a negative experience and then i'm trying to move her before her you know because now her clothes are down and i know with me it's like clothes off bladder is ready to do its thing and so i didn't want her to do that on her clothes and the floor and all that stuff it was just like yikes and i wonder if you know a black toilet seat wouldn't be the most hideous thing in the world to look at you know it's like might not be your aesthetic, but it'd be better than cleaning up potty mess all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I would steer clear of black only because um, really uh, anything above the knees that's black is just disinteresting to them. They don't really focus on it or pay attention to it. So it may not be the best if you're trying to grab their attention towards it. Um, and then anything that's below the knees that's black can actually be very scary. They kind of see it as a whole. And so they might avoid it, actually. So we're not trying to avoid the toilet. We want them to get out of the toilet. So maybe I avoid for- the black seat, but yeah. I forgot about that, but the black. Yeah. There was a gentleman that one of the caregivers, it was her dad, when they bought him this really comfortable black leather recliner, and he loved it. But as he progressed within his disease, he started avoiding the chair. And mm-hmm. I remember having that conversation now, and I'm like, oh, yeah, you probably thought it was like this big gaping hole. So right. no, no black. Apparently I forgot that already. <laughs> so shall we touch on, we've done everything except eating, correct? Have we missed any? Because I know we talked we about eating. 
Yeah, we did eating a little bit in the first uh, session, but I can certainly recap too. Yeah. I can. So, hurt. yeah, absolutely. So, um, with eating again, we want to think about routine. Um, and so the way that you set up the eating experience, the way that the meal goes and how you end the experience should all be just about the same for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you want to think about that first, because the more consistency you have, they're going to go along with what you want them to do because it's safe. It's known. They learn it over time through the use of their senses. So a couple of things that you can do. Um, I know we touched upon aromatherapy. Uh, I would definitely recommend citruses, uh, any citrus scent. It could be lemon, it could be orange. Um, because of the uh, empirical evidence that we found around increasing appetite and improving mood. I mean, nothing's better as a recipe for happy, hungry patients, right? I mean, that's great, right? Or, a loved, or your loved one with dementia. So I would definitely recommend uh, that for aromatherapy. For music, again, I would follow the schedule of the perfect day that I talked about for what you should play for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, that way uh, it helps to facilitate the verbal process and also um, for the evening, for dinner, you're having more of a calming experience. Um, for the setup, now, if you are working in senior living, you'll know what I mean by this is oftentimes dining rooms are multi-purpose. And so you want to make sure that when you're setting up for the dining process, it looks like a dining area meaning that there's table with chairs around it. And if you already have the place, place plateware and all that kind of stuff set up, you want to use that. If you're at home, what you can do is have your loved one help set up with you. If that's a normal routine that they can still do, you want to encourage as much as they can still do, even if it's a minimal amount, because the more you reinforce those skills, which I talk about in the second framework, which is called habilitation, the more you reinforce those skills and you provide praise uh, and they associate a really positive emotion with that, then they're going to want to keep helping you. And that keeps that skill alive. But so setting up that way. Um, now, in terms of plateware, going kind of going back on colors, you definitely want to use bold plateware, either bright red, bright yellow, bright orange. Now, what's been shown in research is they tested both red and um, yellow plates, and they found that red makes you more hungry and yellow sustains your attention. Now that's not specific to that study. They were looking at the plateware specifically, but let's think about the red and yellow colors. I mean, isn't McDonald's a billion dollar business? Someone knew about that, right? So with that said, you know, you can use the plateware based on, so we typically those uh, residents who are uh, more so losing lots of weight, I would recommend the red plate. And for those who are at a healthy weight, uh, maybe use the yellow plate to sustain their attention. When we, I did a small focus group with uh, residents that I was uh, treating in long-term uh, in long-term care, um, I mean, the results were phenomenal. I mean, we were able to increase weight percentages. We were able to get um, a lot of the residents off of supplements so it saved the family money, right? I mean, it was just unbelievable what we saw by just introducing bold plateware. I remember this woman, it was the very first day of the pilot. And uh, I, this just touches me so much. This woman, she never really, uh, she ate breakfast, you know, in her younger years, but as the, the disease onset, as she stopped eating breakfast, she was losing weight, those kinds of things. We had the family there. Some of the family members were there when we introduced this and uh, we served her uh, cereal in a red uh, plate, uh, red plated bowl. And, you know, the the daughter was like, you know, you can try, you know, she hasn't eaten breakfast in, in a couple of years now since she was diagnosed and, and whatnot. It's OK, let's just try it. So she literally took the bowl and didn't remember how to use a spoon anymore, but she took the bowl and literally like drank the whole cereal till it was gone. And I remember looking at the daughter and her and I like had tears of joy. We could not believe that she went for the bowl. She ate the whole thing. She had a smile on her face. It was the most beautiful thing that, you know, I, I've seen really, and that she's obviously seen her mom um, like this. It just was unbelievable. And so we were able to get her weight up to a healthier weight. She was having a better quality of life and things like that. So I, I can't say enough about how bold plateware can be a huge impact only in if you just do anything, bold plateware for the dining experience would be great. Um, and we think about this, you know, my, the framework of, the dementia connection model and talking about retrogenesis, right? And everything's going back to an earlier 
um, age, right, is, I mean, go into any child store, bye bye baby. Um, I don't think babies are us is in business anymore, but you know what I mean? Go to the feeding section and what do they have there? Everything is bold colors, you know, bold plates, bold flatware, blow, you know, everything is bold colors to draw the attention of the child to keep them sustained. So they're so feeding is exciting for them, right? So we've got to have that same mentality with individuals who have dementias. How can we keep this exciting for them? Um, and entice to want to eat. So that's just, those are some tips and tricks on, uh, there's a uh, feeding section in my book as well. So mm -hmm. my mom's memory care used red plates and I'm seriously racking my brain. I may have to actually look through pictures. I don't think they used red plates in the assisted living area. And my, I would take my mom there for lunch a couple, you know, I, I did that closer to the end of her life because it was easier to take her out but in the community, we'd get in the car and drive around the building and get out. And so it was a it was a production, but it was it was a good one. And they they understood I there was like backup. It was much better than going to a restaurant. So that was helpful. But now I'm like, it's driving me bananas to think about did they I don't think they had red plates in the assisted living because they wouldn't need them. And I need to get new plates. So I will not be getting red because I do not need <laughs> to stimulate my appetite. I think blue is the kind of like. Well, blue, like cyan is the opposite of red. So I will look for some cyan plates or something. <laughs> Just Better a pretty color black. anyway. Cyan is yeah, about sky blue for those people who are not photographers or artists like myself. <laughs> so is there any last tips other than by the time this ep the these two episodes come out, the book is already out. I got mm -hmm. an advanced copy. It was awesome. Thank It'll you. It'll be linked in the show notes. Is there any last tips for anybody before we head off into the rest of our days? I would just say, you know, part of it is stepping into their world. And what that means is understanding and accepting that they are living a more younger life than what we would imagine. And to be able to lower expectations that, you know, this is the new person and, you know, they're still themselves inside. It's just, you're seeing a younger version of them. And so celebrate that through this grieving process as much as you can. But through this, it's understanding that you need to have consistency and routine with what you do. So the person feels safe and secure with you. And always remember to stimulate their senses in positive ways to influence positive feelings. And then they're going to associate those with you. And I understand this is not always that easy. It's not always one plus one equals two in this world. We're dealing with humans here, right? Um, and we know humans are unpredictable. But the biggest thing to know is that one is continue to care for yourself as the caregiver, because if your cup is not full, you cannot give any more. And so it is really important that you work in self-care as much as possible, even if it's a few minutes a day, it will make a huge difference in your tolerance of being able to really connect to the person you're caring for. And that's, I do have a section in the book on self-care and then a bonus chapter on brain health. So, cause I know a lot of families are concerned about also developing the disease. So that chapter will help in trying to provide some tips and tricks on how to decrease their chances of developing the disease. So, but yeah, it's um, check us out the, the book right now um, as it stands. It's uh, sold at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Johns Hopkins Press, and then also on our website at neuroessence.org. We have a wellness tool shop filled with all kinds of fun tools uh, for your brain health. And the book is on there as well. And you'll get a signed copy if you go through us. So awesome. And all that's linked in the show notes as well. Make it super easy. Yeah. I think this is, I talked to a lot of authors. This is definitely. If you if you got a limited budget or a limited amount of time for reading, which is more likely, this is probably the one to pick up because it's really, really helpful. And I'm that's coming from somebody who's already gone all the way through this journey. And I talked to lots <laughs> of people. So I think I can say that with some authority. And <laughs> one thing on the appreciating where they are in life, and you talked about, you know, maybe learning who they were at, you know, twenty or fifteen, you know, that's a real beneficial opportunity that mm -hmm. I didn't think about with my mom. Mm -hmm. And I really wish I had learned that before. So that's a, that's a good tip is, you know, it's kind of like being a little bit of a detective, find out what they were <laughs> like when they were teenagers. Cause yes, exactly. you, might, you might have like mental, aha, you weren't as good as you tried to tell me you were. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
Well, exactly. this has been fantastic. I very much appreciate you taking double the amount of time as normal to talk to us. I and appreciate it. Best of luck with the book and anything else you've got going on in this upcoming year. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.